Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Ibn Lund and in this video we're gonna basically go through my DNA test results and uh, I'm going to look at um, what my genetics tells me about my you know, predisposing conditions and uh, what other things I need to pay attention to and I'm also going to be uh, going through the DNA through the self-decode software. So if you haven't heard then uh, self-decode I think it's one of the best uh, DNA, uh, let's say, analytic uh, softwares and uh, services out there because they uh, use the most amount of uh, data possible and they're also like very ethical in terms of their uh, way they handle your data. So like most of these DNA uh, companies, 23andMe and uh, Ancestry Me and those things, they, you know, yeah, they, they take, you take the tests, you, they tell the results, but they also sell your data <laughs> secretly. So that's kind of a really bad thing, but Celtic Code uh, doesn't do that. They have a really uh, strict policy about that. So that's why that, I think that's one of the best uh, kind of um, most uh, accurate um, or most ethical uh, DNA services out there. And they're also the most accurate one uh, because um, they uh, use, instead of like using a handful of uh, these, um, you know, studies, they use this AI uh, software that incorporates millions and millions of uh, these studies and creates these uh, reports based upon uh, the, your results. And uh, yeah, in this video, we're gonna basically go through that, almost play uh, like through what um, what the Celtic code is more about. And uh, we'll go through all these different reports on like uh, gut health, uh, joint pain, uh, diabetes, weight management, and those kind of things, and see what the, what the rep reports tell me about my genetics, and I'll just you know comment. If you want to try out a Celtic code, then yeah, you can also try it out. Uh, you can head over to CelticCode.com and use the code the SEAM. You will get a 10% discount. As a disclaimer, I am also like invested into Celtic code. Uh, but re the reason why I invested into Celtic Code in the first place is because I think that they're the best, they're the best uh, DNA uh, service out there. And uh, yeah, because of the same reason ethics and uh, the accuracy. So uh, yeah, it's not because of, uh, it's not because of like, I'm not saying that they're the best because I'm invested. It's the other way around. I invested because I think they're the best. So uh, yeah, that's it. All right, uh, let's get to it. Initially, we'll just play. This is kind of the uh, initial... Um, this is uh, one of the introduction videos, just to uh, maybe give a brief uh, overview about uh, what self code is more about. Decode, we're personalizing healthcare with recommendations based on your unique DNA, lab test results and environment. Getting started is simple. Order your DNA kit or upload your existing DNA file to your dashboard. Upload your lab tests or order labs from the self code lab shop. Start using self code to optimize your health. Remember, you can get personalized recommendations with just lab tests or only a DNA file. But to take full advantage of Self-Decode's holistic approach, we recommend using both. You might not realize it, but DNA kits only analyze a portion of your DNA, about 700,000 variants. However, at Self-Decode, our AI turns 700,000 variants into 83 million variants using a pro... Yeah, that's a huge difference, like uh, 700,000 versus 83 million. So yeah, I think the yeah they have new new AI 2.0 uh, software that is um, no no one else basically has this kind of a software. At this the is called genetic imputation. This provides the data we need to give you the most accurate analysis and recommendations. When you log on to Self Decode, you'll meet Decode, your AI health coach. He'll ask you key questions about your health and environment in order to personalize your entire experience. Then you can start exploring all of self decodes features. Each wellness report gives you an overview of your genetic risk for a given health topic. You'll also get prioritized lists of diet, supplement, and lifestyle recommendations based on your DNA and other health data. When it comes to labs, you've probably had your doctor tell you if you fall outside the normal range. However, with self decodes labs, you'll get an even more accurate picture of your health by understanding how far you are from the optimal range, because normal doesn't always mean optimal. Start implementing the changes from the list of personalized recommendations and track levels over time to watch them improve. When you find a recommendation that you'd like to try, just add it to your regimen and start building the perfect health regimen for you. No more generic health plans. At Self Decode, we believe that the future of health is personalized. That's why every recommendation we give is tailored to your unique body. Our team of world-class scientists, doctors, and engineers have done the hard work for you and have made self decode easy to understand and easy to use. So, let's get started. It's time to change the way you approach health and finally get to the bottom of your health issues. It's time to give your body what it actually needs. It's time to live optimally. Yay! <laughs> there we go. So, uh, 
yeah, it's a very simple process. Like I already uploaded my uh, DNA file into here. I used the uh, legacy uh, first uh, version as well before, uh, which is also really insightful. But uh, we're going to go through uh, the uh, 2.0, the new uh, AI um, analytics uh, variant. So there's these are the reports. Uh, they also have like uh, constantly updating uh, new reports. So the uh, newest ones I haven't checked out yet. They're still uh, generating the report. Uh, eczema, psoriasis, uh, gut inflammation. I'll maybe like you know follow it up uh, in the future. But uh, they already have like a quite a list, long list of the um, ones that you can already check out. So uh, I think we'll just you know, start from the top and uh, go through these reports to uh, see what my uh, DNA tells me <laughs> about my health. So the first is uh, gallstones. And as you can see, at the top, there's already the, uh, just the summary immediately. I have an average risk of gallstones. So I've never had gallstones myself. In the, never, I've never had any issues uh, with that. Um, but yeah, I do think that it may be something that uh, I could be predisposed to. Or it's like, you know, an average risk. The risks themselves are also like, you have to c keep in mind that just because you have a high risk of something, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to get it uh, or you're going to get it. It's a very like a risk it's just a risk, so to say. Like uh, some people have high risk of cancer, but they never get cancer. And uh, but you know, the, if you if you have a high risk for cancer, for example, then uh, smoking for you or um, following a bad lifestyle would be much more dangerous than for someone who has low risk of cancer because their genetics isn't predisposing them to get cancer. So if you have high risk of something, then you still have to be, let's say, cautious of uh, certain things uh, to avoid getting that particular condition, whether that be heart disease or cancer. And here are also the recommendations uh, based upon the uh, results. And uh, number one is going to be maintain a healthy weight. Two, choose healthy fats. Three, fiber. Four, avoid cigarette smoke. Uh, five, vitamin C. And on the right, you can also see um, the impact. Basically, the uh, impact shows how strong the recommendation will affect your health in a certain area. And uh, the evidence, which is uh, the amount of scientific uh, evidence to support it. So it's... Uh, so five point uh, scale, uh, five point scale, and uh, the recommendations are basically it's going to give a score how big of an impact or how much evidence there is uh, to support it. For healthy weight, there is a high a high impact for uh, gallstones in terms of um, preventing gallstones, and the evidence is also that uh, four out of five that uh, maintaining a healthy weight is important for gallstones. Uh, whereas with vitamin C, for example, the impact is only two out of five. And the evidence is also 2 out of 5. So vitamin C may help with gallstones, uh, but the impact is small and the evidence also isn't uh, that strong. So you can... And all the, all the studies are also referenced uh, in the report below. Uh, but we'll get to it uh, shortly. Here is a little like introduction about the issue. What is the gallbladder? How does it work? How do gallstones uh, form? Um, yeah, like it says like uh, most people have 2 to 20 stones. The Guinness World Record was... Uh, 23,000 <laughs> stones. So, uh, yeah, like it's a kind of a good uh, report uh, overview. It tells you what kind of um, a variant of the gene is going to be predisposing you to get the particular uh, condition. Uh, and, uh, yeah, then there's going to be more overview about your genetics. So this is the more detailed overview. As you can see, for me, it says my risk is average. And uh, it's uh, slightly in the middle and a slight, maybe like a mi little bit uh, higher. Um, I'm I'm 55th percentile in terms of uh, my risk for uh, gallstones. My risk is greater than 55% of the population and lower than 45% of the population. So I'm like, you know, basically in the middle somewhere. More information about uh, the gallstones. In the United States, up to 8% of men and 17% of women have gallstones. Besides gender, other risk factors include Pregnancy, obesity, rapid weight loss, fasting for long periods, gut surgeries, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, which is uh, true. And you can see it's also the reference, reference the studies. We'll click one of the references. Takes us to an article, uh, PubMed article that talks about uh, the uh, association of uh, gallstones, and I think that is like age, mean age, and the gallstones. Uh, yeah, we'll keep scrolling down. Experts recommending seeing a doctor if you have any signs and symptoms of a gallbladder attack, including gut pain lasting for several hours, nausea and vomiting, fever or chills, a yellowish color in the skin or white eyes, white or, or skin of the whites, <laughs> a dark urine or light colored stool. Up to 30 up to thirty percent of differences in people's changes of developing gallstones may be attributed to genetics. 
and genetics involved in gallstone formation may influence cholesterol metabolism, bile metabolism, and liver function. So yeah, most of it uh, comes from yeah, just like the liver and bile, and gallbladder, kind of th those kinds of uh, organs involved with uh, the metabolism of gallstones. And if you have like some, let's say, bad liver function or uh, bad uh, bile production genetically, then uh, your increased risk of uh, gallbladder or of gallstones as well. What are the recommendations then? I'm uh, going to go through the recommendations again. Uh, number one, maintain a healthy weight. The impact is high, evidence is also high, and there's also like these studies. People have a healthy weight when they don't have too much or too little body weight, body fat. Uh, tells you the BMI, tells you um, other things. Um, here we go, here's the uh, association with uh, obesity and uh, gallstones. Overweight and obese people may be at a higher risk of forming gallstones. In fact, the risk may increase by about 60% for every 5 unit increase in BMI. The link may be strongest for women. It gives you the studies, the references. Experts recommend eating less calories and getting more exercise to achieve and maintain a healthy weight. Weight gain even within the normal body weight range may cause gallstones to form. There's also a link between excess body weight and gallstones uh, with insulin resistance. And insulin resistance may promote gallstone formation by increasing cholesterol in the bile, decreasing gallbladder movements, and promoting toxic bile acid formation. So that's good to, yeah, like, uh, obviously, maintaining healthy weight is uh, important for other things, uh, but uh, it apparently also helps with uh, gallstones. Uh, number two, choose healthy fats. There we go. Peep, uh, in large amounts, saturated and trans fats may have a negative impact on your health. Uh, experts say you should add more PUFAs, polyunsaturated fats, for optimal health. A uh, higher intake of trans and saturated fats is linked to gallstones. This is because these fats are more likely to raise blood cholesterol. And yeah, like the gallstones uh, are, they contain uh, cholesterol as well. So um, uh, high blood cholesterol may raise the amount of cholesterol in the bile. Elevated cholesterol in the bile is a major major cause of gallstone formation. On the other hand, a diet rich in healthy fats may help reduce cholesterol and prevent gallstones. There we go, uh, fiber as well. Experts agree that eating foods high in fiber may help prevent gallstones. They recommend eating more fiber rich fruits and vegetables. Um, Dun, dun, dun. The fiber is going to reduce toxic bile acids, boost beneficial bile acids, and reduce cholesterol, which will then uh, reduce gold, gallstones. And number four, avoid cigarette smoke. Let's see what it is. Current and former smokers may be at an increased risk of gallstones. In fact, the risk of gallstones may increase by 11% with every 10 cigarettes smoked per day. So yeah, I've never smoked... Like, you know, I've, tr I've tried it, but I've never been a, like a regular smoker, never. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's a bad, not only for heart disease and cancer, but also bad for uh, gallstones. Because the smoking may impair also cholesterol metabolism uh, more into people with your CETP gene variant. So I have this variant, which is bad for uh, the gall gallstones. And the smoking also has a negative impact on that. And lastly, vitamin C. How vitamin C helps with gallstones. Experts say that vitamin C, 2,000 milligrams a day, may prevent gallstones. It likely helps by preventing the buildup of cholesterol in the bile. Uh, likewise, low intake of vitamin C is linked to developing gallstones. Please note that uh, supplementing with vitamin C is linked to a slightly higher risk of kidney stones in men. Talk to your doctor before uh, taking vitamin C. So yeah, that's good to know. <laughs> you don't want to be uh, getting kidney stones if you're thinking that you're... Uh, like uh, reducing your gallstone uh, risk. So uh, yeah, I don't think that uh, high vitamin C intake uh, may not be necessary. At least like regularly, it's not re recommended to take like a high dose of uh, vitamin C all the time because of, um, you know, your body actually may need some of that small amount of uh, stress and oxidative stress. If you're healthy generally, you're getting the vitamin C from whole foods, then you shouldn't uh, take like a vitamin C regularly. Uh, you should take it only uh, if you're like getting sick or something like that. Let's move on with the kidney health. Let's look at uh, what the, the DNA tells me about my kidney, kidney health. Summary, I have a reduced risk of chronic kidney disease, which is good, and uh, risk is very low, low risk. What are the recommendations? Maintain a healthy weight, again, uh, strong evidence, uh, strong impact. Exercise, avoid cigarette smoke, balance potassium intake, a Mediterranean diet, and a plant-based diet for uh, the kidney health. What does it tell us about kidneys? 
just uh, overall information about uh, how the kidneys work and uh, yeah, what what kind of genes are involved there. Variants of certain genes like ALPL and uh, GPX1 have been associated with higher levels of uh, phosphorus. And uh, excess uh, phosphorus can cause a buildup of uh, calcium in the kidneys, which has been linked to kidney damage. So that's good to know. Excess phosphorus, yeah, is bad for also like magnesium status. It uh, reduces magnesium status. So uh, you want to make sure you're not getting enough phosphorus in, 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 in the first place. So here we go. Overview. My uh, r risk for kidney disease is low. I mean the 11th percentile. So my risk is greater than 11% of the population and lower than 89% of the population. So yeah, I'm in the green zone. <laughs> my risk is very low. My risk is lower than 89% of people, uh, which is good. I've never had any kidney issues and uh, yeah, never had any kind of problems with that. All right. Uh, your kidneys are part of your body's natural detox system. They filter your blood and remove excess water, salt, minerals and waste. All of these materials leave your body as urine. If something goes wrong with this system, chronic kidney disease can arise. Chronic kidney disease has five stages. These range from kidney damage, stage 1, to total kidney failure, stage 5. <laughs> uh, early stage kidney disease is often detected by tests looking for high blood pressure, protein in the urine, and waste in the blood. However, obvious signs and symptoms may not appear until later stages. These can include changes in how often you urinate, fatigue, itching, twitching or cramping muscles, and foot and ankle swelling. According to the CDC, about 15% of American adults have chronic kidney disease, and most don't even know that anything is wrong. Uh, factors that contribute to kidney problems include male gender, African-American ancestry, cigarette smoking, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, low birth weight, aging, and genetics. Um... To manage kidney disease, a doctor may recommend medication, diets low in protein, salt or phosphorus, weight management, avoiding cigarettes and reducing stress. Uh, so yeah, like usually uh, they say that uh, you know protein is bad for the kidneys, but there isn't you no know, association between healthy people and uh, kidney disease with uh, protein intake. So if you are uh, if you don't have any uh, health issues and you have like low uh, genetic risk for kidney disease as well, then a high protein diet does nothing to your kidneys. In a negative way, it may actually be beneficial. Uh, so yeah, but but if you are let's say uh, already have pre-existing kidney damage, then yeah, reducing the protein intake can be a smart idea, at least in the short term. Uh, but yeah, other other than that, you don't uh, really need to worry about the protein intake. So recommendations again: maintain a healthy weight. Um, experts agree that a healthy weight can support kidney health. Being overweight or obese may increase the odds of this condition up to three times, which is bad. Exercise. Experts agree that 30 to 60 minutes of moderate exercise most days of the week may support kidney health. Increased physical activity is linked to an 18% lower risk of kidney disease. So yeah, I do exercise uh, every day, at least yeah, 30 minutes and, and up to 60 minutes and sometimes more even. Uh, cigarette smoke. Experts agree that cigarette smoke can increase the risk of kidney disease. This is especially true for heavy smokers and people with high blood pressure or diabetes. Smoking may increase the odds of kidney disease in people with your NOS3 gene variant. So I have this NOS3 gene variant. Let's you know check it out what it is. And the smoking increases the risk of kidney disease from that. Nitric oxide synthase 3 or ENOS uh, NOS3. So yeah, you know nitric oxide helps with blood vessels, uh, vasodilation, and uh, mutations have been linked to several diseases such as coronary spasm, stroke, Alzheimer's, high blood pressure, uh, seizures. Uh, so I have this uh, NOS3 and uh, the smoking is going to be bad for that. We'll see like whether or not this NOS3 pops up in other, other reports like the heart health or something like that. Uh, no, number four, a balanced potassium intake. The FDA recommends getting 4700 milligrams of potassium every day and uh, potassium regulates uh, blood pressure and supports kidney function. It's important for the kidney health. Uh, both low and high blood potassium are linked to complications of kidney disease. So yeah, like the b biggest uh, sources of potassium. Um, I, I think I do think that I get uh, this uh, 1,400 milligrams a day from Whole Foods. I don't take any potassium supplements and you know, no potassium salts. Uh, the foods that I eat usually have potassium, like uh, I eat a lot of uh, carrots, uh, tubers, leafy greens, 
as well as potatoes. Uh, potatoes are actually uh, the highest source of potassium. Like one medium potato can have like a 900 to 1000 uh, milligrams of potassium. And uh, I eat them like regularly, but not every day, uh, but, but quite, quite frequently. So the bananas actually have only uh, 420 milligrams. So yeah, it's much lower than uh, the potatoes. So potatoes are actually a really good source of the potassium. Mediterranean diet, uh, which is, you know, the slightly lower carb, healthy fat uh, type of a diet. Plant-based diets, I don't think that it's mostly because of the higher amount of uh, potassium uh, that uh, contributes uh, to that. And the impact and evidence is kind of an average for plant-based diets in terms of uh, kidney health. All right, next up, let's move on with uh, shoulder and neck pain. The report is coming up. My uh, risk is high, increased risk of shoulder and neck pain, <laughs> which is bad. Uh, I don't, uh, I've never had any shoulder or neck pain, uh, which is good. Um, so yeah, but the genetic risk is still high. I do have like maybe uh, some other family members that uh, can have it every once in a while. Uh, but not, I, personally, not me. I like, I've, you know, lifting weights, I do mobility exercises, I eat, I stay healthy, I sleep well. Uh, so I haven't had any, like, any no joint issues at all. Uh, recommendations based upon this. Uh, number one, reduce shoulder and neck strain. Try to reduce tension in your shoulders and neck. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously, you still need to apply some uh, tension and some uh, pressure and stress to those regions to strengthen them. Like, if you didn't lift any weights, then your joints become weak. And uh, doing resistance training is one of the best ways to strengthen your joints and actually prevent getting pain, um, like preventing yourself from getting these mobility issues and those kind of things if you practice with good form. And yoga and whatever, any other kinds of good things uh, for that. But, you know, in excess, if you do with bad, bad form, you're doing the wrong exercises with you know, poor form, uh, then, uh, yeah, you're, you may still get some injuries. Exercise therapy... Topical capsaicin, which is interesting. So capsaicin is the kind of active compound of uh, cayenne pepper. And topical capsaicin, <laughs> applying it to the uh, neck and shoulders, apparently then will have a pain-relieving effect, uh, I would imagine. But the ev evidence and the impact is uh, quite low. Although it would be interesting to try it out. <laughs> like if it starts to like itch or scratch or I would imagine like uh, burns, burns the skin. Acupuncture, low impact, low evidence, hot and cold applications, medium kind of impact. How would you feel if you had to carry 40 bananas or 5 pineapples with you everywhere you go? <laughs> It'd probably get pretty tiring, right? With the average human head weighing in around 5 kilograms, that's exactly what your neck and shoulders contend with on a daily basis. <laughs> so yeah, your head is pretty heavy then, and uh, it's an important organ, and you know your neck is all, you're almost yeah, so like even more important in terms of like connecting your brain with the spine and uh, whatnot. So you wouldn't want to have like a weak neck anyway. <laughs> you want to strengthen your neck uh, at all costs because you know it's a very fragile tissue. You know you can you can easily break it if you fall onto your head or uh, someone else, someone else can also snap it very easily. So yeah, training your neck is something that most people never do, uh, but it's still something to kind of uh, think about. Like different kinds of these uh, neck bridges initially, neck circles. Um, you can also do it with weights. Uh, but yeah, but it's also like very easily, you can e in injure it very easily if you overdo it. But some sort of like wrestlers do a lot of these neck bridges and uh, those kinds of exercises. Other like deadlifts are also like pretty neck heavy. Like you're pulling the deadlift like, ah, and then you're forced to kind of tighten up your neck and the traps also then that does will uh, strengthen the neck to a certain extent. Uh, let's say my risk is uh, pretty high, super high in the... 89th percentile, so my risk is greater than 89% of the population and lower than 11% of the population, which means that, uh, yeah, I may get chronic uh, shoulder pain and neck pain more than 89% of people, which is still, you know, fine. I've never, I've never had it, so, <laughs> so far so good. About one in five adults struggle with shoulder or neck pain, which I, th I would imagine is quite... Uh, debilitating or <laughs> disturbing to have some sort of a chronic pain in your like joints so number one I reduce shoulder and neck strain which means poor posture prolonged sitting 
poor sleeping position, injury, overuse, stress. Okay, so that's a, like a more yeah, a reasonable approach that um, different kinds of, like the smartphone, smartphone look that where you're looking at your smartphone all the time with this, you know, crooked uh, look, <laughs> you know, like, you know, hinging downwards and in this very kind of compromised position. So that is like the smartphone uh, shoulders and smartphone head is definitely uh, something that I do think that will help, will, will damage, you know, your neck uh, and uh, shoulders as well, like this uh, forward position rolling over. So yeah, you don't want to be doing uh, basically too much uh, sitting and too much uh, computer work where you are in this um, forward leaning uh, position all the time. And if you do uh, do that, like most people are forced to do that and they choose to do that uh, so that you have to kind of rebalance it with the other way around of, you know, opening it back up with uh, different kinds of stretches and uh, mobility exercises, which I do uh, quite regularly. <clears throat> Let's move on. Exercise therapy, uh, strengthening and flexibility and stretching, which I already talked about. Uh, topical capsaicin. <laughs> uh, capsaicin is a compound that makes chili pepper spicy. Capsaicin creams and patches. Uh, Long-term capsaicin use may reduce pain sensitivity, which is interesting. Uh, so I, I would imagine that you're uh, yeah using it topically, and uh, after a lot while, your body gets used to it. So it becomes less sensitive to pain, which is something that I also believe in general. Like um, if you are, let's say, in a very uh, <laughs> like a bubble wrap, you're living inside a bubble wrap, you're never experiencing any pain and discomfort, uh, then yeah, you, your body will get soft and you will be very uh, sensitive against those things. Whereas if you, you know, gradually expose yourself to different kinds of uh, physical things uh, that cause a little small amount of pain, uh, then your pain sensitivity goes down and your pain tolerance goes up so you can tolerate it uh, much more easily. Uh, acupuncture, that is uh, kind of medium or low, low evidence. Hot and cold therapy is also kind of medium. Mm, which I would think I would, if I were to get any sort of like a neck pain, shoulder pain, then I would uh, use the hot and cold the first. I already do the sauna quite regularly. I don't do the I don't do the acupuncture, and I don't do the topical capsaicin, but I do uh, strengthen and uh, exercises. Next up, uh, fatigue. What does it tell me about my fatigue and energy? Slightly increased risk of fatigue. <laughs> Uh, like above average, above average risk. What do I need to do? Optimize sleep. Try to get seven to eight hours of good quality sleep, which is high evidence and high impact. Address food sensitivities. Uh, iron, supplement iron. Uh, stay hydrated. Coenzyme Q10 uh, and vitamin D. So fatigue would probably describe you know, chronic fatigue and being tired all the time, not having any energy. Uh, so yeah, my risk is greater than 69% of the population and lower than 31% of the population. Um, well, I would say that uh, I'm not genetically like a super energized person. <laughs> like I'm not like a like a like, I don't know like energy ball. So I don't have like this unlimited energy. Uh, or depends on the you know, situation. I I may be I may have that every once in a while. But um, yeah, like I'm genetically not super hyped up all the time or super energized in in a sense. I'm not like a f you know fatigue person either. I never had any chronic fatigue or anything. I always have energy, uh, but the energy is more like stable. I'm never like this super amped up. <laughs> I don't have like this super amped up energy and I, I don't crash either. Like I'm always stable. I'm always uh, stable and I'm, I'm able to have this energy for many hours. Like I'm, I never get tired when I'm working. I never get tired even if I'm, I'm doing like a lot of exercise. Uh, so my energy is very stable and um, long endurance. Like I'm, I can go for days and days without getting tired. Um, but yeah, let's say my fatigue risk would be slightly above average because of probably uh, some uh, risk factors. Uh, these kind of uh, genes. Up to 40% of differences in people's chances of having chronic fatigue may be attributed to genetics. So yeah, that's uh, interesting. Like 40% of your risk of uh, chronic fatigue may be up to uh, genetics. And uh, that can be from like sleep, that can be from the immune system and stress uh, response and uh, brain chemistry as well. So it lists out all these um, gene variants for each of them. COMPT is a common uh, gene, TNF, IL-6, IL-4. So what do we need to do to prevent chronic fatigue? Optimize sleep, try to get seven to eight hours. Mm. Yeah, which is obvious. <laughs> if you don't sleep, then you're gonna get tired. Uh, I sleep pretty well. I can get away with like pretty less sleep. I can sleep only like, you know, two hours and still be fine. 
and without really uh, having a negative effect on my energy levels or my fatigue. But if I were to do it, yeah, for like weeks or something, uh, then yeah, probably it will catch up on me. And maybe maybe it would be that uh, because of my high risk of uh, fatigue, I would uh, crash a bit sooner. Maybe like if I were to not get any sleep for uh, seven days, for example, then maybe I would get the chronic fatigue. Or, or like you know some aspects of this uh, fatigue uh, faster but who knows i've never been <laughs> without sleep for like uh, seven days number two address food sensitivities the impact is a medium so uh you usually when you when you have like these food sensitivities and allergies then uh, it's going to sap away your energy because of keeping your body under inflammation and uh, autoimmune response so uh you know, it will drain your energy levels and uh, keep you tired because of that. So, uh, yeah, I don't have like any food sensitivities, like zero. I have zero allergies. I can eat <laughs> all kinds of food. I can eat like all the gluten and I've never, never had any issues with that. Uh, so I think that is something that I don't really have to worry about. Uh, iron. So sub iron is you know, obviously important for hemoglobin and oxygenation of the, uh, of the body. Uh, but... Let's say supplementing iron may not be the uh, most, um, you know, uh, effective way of actually raising your hemoglobin and uh, improving oxygenation because uh, you need copper to activate the iron and to also uh, produce red blood cells. So, um, yeah, like I wouldn't supplement like iron, especially if you're like uh, male, because males already have higher iron levels and uh, that can cause like excess iron accumulation. Mm. The idea would be much smarter to raise your iron status, uh, which can be th which can be done by increasing your copper intake. So uh, copper from uh, liver, uh, dark chocolate, uh, beans, those kinds of foods, oysters have more copper, and that copper will help to activate the iron and absorb it better. So if you have low iron, then it may not be that you're not eating enough iron. It's uh, actually maybe that you're not eating enough uh, copper, which is good to know. Like we talk about in the mineral fix uh, quite well. We list out all the history about that. And uh, it's uh, important. Stay hydrated. You know, obviously water is important. And uh, dehydration can also definitely reduce performance and uh, energy. Coenzyme Q10, which is one of the mitochondrial uh, supplements. Uh, I do take a CoQ10 uh, on a daily basis, about uh, yeah, 300 milligrams a day. So yeah, it helps with energy production and fat oxidation. Uh, you could get it from also whole foods, uh, but I do take the CoQ10 as a supplement because of... It may also help with uh, like, uh, you know, heart health and uh, longevity. And lastly, vitamin D. Sunlight is the main source of vitamin D. And uh, I do take like a vitamin D uh, sometimes. My vitamin D levels are pretty okay. Like uh, they're 60 nanograms per deciliter usually. And the optimal zone is yeah between 60 to 80. So you have to just pay attention to your vitamin D uh, levels. If you have low vitamin D levels and you are feeling fatigued, then uh, yeah, that's probably going to be something that contributes uh, to that. Next up, uh, chronic pain. I'm going to try to uh, get it a bit faster then, otherwise it's going to be like a <laughs> two-hour episode. <laughs> uh, but I'll just you know go through some of the main uh, points here. Chronic pain. I have reduced risk of chronic pain, and it's a very low risk, which is uh, good to hear. <laughs> And uh, acupuncture helps with uh, chronic pain, hypnosis, topical capsaicin, again, PEA, which we'll see what it is, and the physiotherapy. So chronic pain uh, probably refers to just you know, muscle pain and aches and uh, that kind of thing. My risk is low. I'm in the fourth percentile. My risk is greater than 4% of the population and lower than 96% of the population. <laughs> so uh, I basically experience uh, less chronic pain than 96% of uh, people, or my risk for chronic pain is uh, lower than 96% of people, which is something I do think that can be uh, true. I, I don't have, I have like a pretty high pain tolerance and a pain threshold. Uh, so yeah, might be like genetics. This includes lower back pain, headaches, widespread pain, nerve pain. Okay, what do I need to do? Acupuncture. So uh, the needles, thin needles, or like the acupuncture mattress can also be something like that, maybe usually for relaxation and sleep. Hypnosis. Um, okay. There isn't like a lot of uh, high quality evidence to support hypnosis for chronic pain. Um, I've never tried like hypnosis either. Topical capsaicin again for the uh, pain response. Uh, PEA, which is 
Palmito Palmito ulethanol anamide <laughs> It's a compound naturally made by the body to help combat inflammation. It is also made by plants and other animals. Good sources of PEA include soy lecithin, uh, soybeans, egg yolks, and peanuts. Well, I do eat egg yolks, so I uh, might be getting some PEA from that. And physiotherapy. Obviously, yeah, like if you have imbalances, muscle imbalances, poor mobility, then uh, your risk of uh, chronic pain will also increase. Because of that, you're like putting a body under different uh, jeopardized uh, positions. Insomnia. Average risk of insomnia. Which is good. I've never had insomnia. I sleep pretty well. I sleep uh, fast. <laughs> I fall asleep fast as well. Uh, psychotherapy. Discuss psychotherapy with your doctor. <laughs> strong evidence and strong impact. Okay, that's interesting uh, that the psychotherapy is the biggest one uh, that helps with insomnia. Uh, relaxation techniques. Light exposure, obviously the circadian component. Uh, reduce caffeine intake, acupuncture and avoid sugary foods. So how many people have insomnia? What's the statistics? Uh, every year, one in three people in the US experience issues getting a good night's sleep. But thankfully, these problems are short-lived uh, for most. I think the statistics for insomnia is pretty crazy. Like, uh, like 40% of people experience some form of insomnia or some form of like sleeplessness, uh, at least once in their life, if I'm not mistaken, something I've heard before. Okay, my risk is 56th percentile. My risk is greater than 56% of the population and lower than 44% of the population. That's uh, good to know. So I'm like uh, somewhere in the middle. If your internal clock is disrupted, it can lead to insomnia. People with insomnia have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or both. In fact, in insomnia is the most common sleep condition in the US. In fact, about one in four Americans are struggling with it. Right. What do we need to do? Uh, psychotherapy. So psychotherapy or talk therapy <laughs> involves talking about your health with a licensed therapist. It may improve the way you react to certain experiences. So maybe like it helps to uh, like um, react to outside events better that cause less stress and less anxiety. Because I think the insomnia would be mostly like this rumination and psychological turmoil in your head that's keeping you up. And uh, obviously psychotherapy, psychologists... Uh, can help to untangle those uh, issues. Uh, relaxation uh, techniques are strong evidence and strong impact. Relaxation techniques such as yoga and meditation can release stress in different ways. Most of them focus on breathing and help you get rid of uh, negative thoughts and emotions. Stress often makes it difficult to sleep. This is because cortisol and other stress hormones can throw off your body's internal clock. Yeah. The um, circadian clock, that is, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. <laughs> Int clicking on the study for a moment, uh, interaction between circadian rhythms and stress. Uh, life on Earth had adapted to a day and a cycle of evolution of internal so-called circadian clocks that adjust behavior and uh, physiology to the recurring changes in environmental conditions. In mammals, a master pacemaker located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus receives environmental light information and synchronizes peripheral tissues and central non-suprachiasmatic nucleus clocks to a gear of physical time. Regulatory systems such as the HPA axis and the autonomic nervous system, both being important for the regulation of stress responses, receive strong, strong circadian input. So yeah, the, the uh, cortisol uh, rises uh, mostly in the morning and uh, the that's where you're supposed to have like this peak in uh, cortisol and at night when you're falling asleep your cortisol should be low whereas if you are you know stressed out before going to bed then uh, yeah your your cortisol may be actually elevated before bed which is you know obviously bad and uh, disrupts the circadian rhythm and keeps you up uh, relaxation techniques that may improve sleep include listening to music mindfulness yoga lavender aromatherapy and a massage so there you go uh, light exposure, sunlight or bright light during day can benefit your body and mind. It boosts mood, boosts performance and energy and improves sleep quality. Experts recommend getting at least 5 to 15 minutes of midday sun 2 to 3 times per week. <laughs> well, that's a little, that's a really weak recommendation, like uh, 5 to 15 minutes uh, 2 to 3 times a week. <laughs> I would say that you need to do that every day and several times a day. And yeah, the research does find that the more sunlight and more daylight uh, you get exposed to during daytime, the more melatonin you produce at night and the better you sleep. So uh, yeah, I would say like at least 60 minutes a day you should be outside exposed to sunlight and uh, do that every day. 
if you don't have the sunlight or it's cloudy, then you can use all these uh, like face lamps or the bright light devices that I have next to my here as well. So I've been using that uh, when it's cloudy or in the mornings when the sun isn't out yet. So yeah, you still need some uh, this light, bright lights to uh, kickstart the circadian rhythm. Uh, how light exposure affects insomnia. Many behaviors that alter your sleep schedule may have a negative impact on your internal clock. Uh, these include traveling across different time zones, working night or irregular shifts, and increased bright light exposure in the evening. Uh, you can lower your exposure to bright light in the evening by minimizing your screen time. Yeah, so using the blue blockers is obviously a good thing. And getting a healthy dose of sunlight is the easiest way to get more bright light during the day. And number four, reduce caffeine intake. Mm. Yeah, obviously, if you drink coffee, then uh, you're going to stay up. Uh, I personally have, um, I'm a fast metabolizer of caffeine, so my liver metabolizes caffeine faster than a slow metabolizer. And uh, yeah, personally, I don't really, of course, yeah, if I drink coffee like immediately before bed, then I'll <laughs> stay up and I'll not be able to fall asleep. Uh, but I can uh, consume the co coffee uh, and caffeine even like, Maybe 6 p.m. and still be fine by going to bed. Uh, whereas some people, they need to cut off their caffeine intake uh, even before 12 at, at uh, noon. So they need to consume, consume coffee only like in uh, 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. and 7 a.m. somewhere like that without interfering with their sleep. Because they have like a slow metabolizer gene. Acupuncture, again, avoid sugary foods. How sugary foods help with insomnia? Avoiding sugary foods. Uh, eating large amounts of sugary foods may make it harder to sleep. Sugary foods spike your blood sugar and insulin, and insulin can trigger the release of chemicals that keep you awake. Well, there you go. Keeps you excited. <laughs> allergies. Next report. What's my risk for allergies? I don't have any allergies. No uh, food sensitivities. Uh, never had it. Uh, my risk is average. Average risk. Um, what to do? Allergy immunotherapy. Nasal cleansing, exercise, probiotics, butter burr, acupuncture, and nasal light therapy. So yeah, allergies, anything like um, gluten, uh, dairy, histamine, lectins, whatnot. I'm 40 42nd percentile. My risk is greater than 42% of the population and lower than 58% of the population. So I'm uh, below average. I don't have any allergies. My family members don't also have like any uh, allergies. Like I don't know anyone. Uh, maybe like a few of them have. Like uh, one person I know has allergies to uh, bees, <laughs> like a bee sting. Uh, they can uh, die to that even. Uh, my brother has some allergies against like uh, hay hay fever, but it's um, I don't think that it's genetically uh, caused. It's more like epigenetically maybe. Uh, let's see. Allergy immunotherapy, you need to do that. Uh, allergy immunotherapy involves safely exposing someone to an allergy trigger. First, the allergen is diluted. Then a person is exposed to a small amount of it. More and more of the allergen is added during this process. <laughs> so they're describing the microdosing, <laughs> uh, microdosing the allergen in small amounts to uh, strengthen the uh, immune response against that and over eventually overcome the uh, allergy. So uh, yeah, like... I think that it's, um, for sure, it, it has strong impact and strong evidence, apparently, for treating that. If you have, like, a serious allergic condition, then you don't want to be doing that. Uh, but it's apparently still possible to um, regain your, uh, you, you rebuild this, this response to the allergen and uh, strengthen it and not have the allergy response that severe. So, yeah, <laughs> as a healthy person, if you don't have any allergies then uh, avoiding these, all these allergens can also be bad because your body will eventually lose the uh, reference uh, experience, how to deal with that. So if you avoid all gluten all the time, you avoid all dairy. If you don't have any allergies, you're not uh, gluten intolerant, you're not lactose intolerant, and you're avoiding those uh, allergens, then who knows, maybe like in uh, five years or so, you may actually develop some sort of a bad response to that because you avoid it. So that's why microdosing those things <laughs> on a, like a semi-frequent basis is a good idea to introduce those compounds into a system and... Um, and uh, keep the immune system adaptable uh, towards or against them. Uh, so that's why, yeah, having a bit of like some things that have gluten and uh, these bad foods uh, every once in a while can actually be a good thing. Mm. Nasal cleansing. So this is like the uh, neti pot strategy. 
If you suffer from respiratory allergies, experts recommend cleansing your nose with a sterile salt solution. The process flushes out allergens and helps relieve congestion. It's cheap, safe, and easy to use. Yeah, yeah, the uh, neti potty, you uh, pour this salt water <laughs> into your nose, and the salt is also like, you know, antibacterial, antiviral, and uh, also cl cleanses, helps to remove all these pathogens that may be there in inside your nose. Exercise, uh, probiotics, butter burr. Uh, butter burr is a shrub that has been used in traditional medicine for thousands of years. Okay, some sort of a herb. Acupuncture, nasal light therapy. Maybe, uh, maybe like the red light could also be there. Yeah, red light, infrared light, and uh, UV light helps with uh, allergies in, in the nose. But the evidence wasn't like that strong. How much do we have left that we have? Okay, we have about 10 left, <laughs> 10 reports left, so uh, we'll get faster. Heart health, slightly reduced risk of heart vessel issues, which is great, below average risk, which I'm happy to hear. <laughs> um, avoid cigarette smoke, obviously the most important thing uh, for uh, heart health. Exercise, choose healthy fats, optimize sleep, maintain a healthy weight, nuts, fiber, and relaxation techniques. I'm in the 34th percentile. My risk is greater than 34% of the population and lower than 66% of the population. In the US, one in three deaths from heart disease could be prevented. And yeah, like heart disease, the, one, the number one killer, like medical uh, killer in the world. And uh, yeah, fortunate to have below average risk, which doesn't mean that I couldn't get it. <laughs> like if I turned obese and get metabolic syndrome, um, smoked and uh, drank alcohol and uh, that's something then i'll probably get it but yeah i'm not doing those things <laughs> i'm not uh, i'm not having like any bad lifestyle habits uh, so yeah we'll keep it at this uh, short tinnitus so this ringing in the ear what's my risk of tinnitus increased risk of tinnitus super high risk <laughs> which is bad avoid loud noises no <laughs> i like to listen to metal so uh and uh, but I don't. I've never had any tinnitus issues, um, so I think that's fine. Melatonin. Consider supplementing with melatonin. I do that sometimes. Avoid cigarette smoke. Sound therapy. Ask your doctor about sound therapy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure my doctor doesn't know anything about sound therapy. Uh, so yeah. Tinnitus risk is at 93, 93rd percentile. Uh, your risk is greater than 93% of the population and lower than 7% of the population. And uh, yeah, it's pretty high. Ghost sounds, <laughs> described as ghost sounds, which is tinnitus. Well, I would never had any uh, ringing in the ear or something like that, uh, which is maybe also, maybe that's also like another, this hormetic uh, adaptations that uh, because I am listening to slightly louder and heavier music than my body and uh, ears have be developed some like a resistance <laughs> against those things and uh, my risk of getting tinnitus in the future is also lower like I listen to metal when I'm sleeping even sometimes uh, when I'm taking a nap I'm listening to like death metal in my ears and it actually helps me to sleep better <laughs> because of somehow like you know blocking out the outside noise or something uh, so yeah at least my tinnitus uh, hasn't at least for the time being hasn't had any issues uh, with that uh, weight, but I, I would imagine that uh, if I didn't listen to uh, heavy music and I was like very silent all the time so, so Silent music all the time then I probably would be very sensitive against loud noises as well You know if you are used to being in a very quiet environment all the time and you go to some, some, lo, somewhere noisy Then uh, you would uh, freak out a lot more uh, Whereas if you are used to like let's say working in a nightclub or something then of course Yeah, your ears gonna get damaged and uh, your you're gonna get hear loss eventually, but uh, your tolerance for the uh, loud noises is also higher. All right, weight, reduced risk of being overweight or obese, and uh, low risk is great, very, very low risk. What you need to do, limit calorie intake, obviously, exercise, eat more protein and less carbs, which I agree, fiber, Mediterranean diet, optimize sleep, and green tea. <laughs> I'm in the second percentile for uh, weight loss, and which is <laughs> I'm at the absolute lowest part when it comes to uh, risk of obesity, my risk is greater than 2% of the population and lower than 98% of the population. So only 2% of people have a lower risk of obesity than me. And uh, my risk is uh, lower than 98% of people, which is uh, great. I've never been obese. 
I've never been, uh, you know, overweight. So that's good to hear. We, but I, I, I could easily, if I wanted to, like, if I wanted to get fat, I'll just eat whatever and I'll still get fat, you know, obviously. Uh, but let's say this refers to probably a combination of physiological uh, genetics and psychological traits that you have, like, a maybe more um, better satiety control and a better, better energy intake. You're not, uh, like, habitually overeating. You get fuller faster and uh, you may have, like, a more spontaneous energy uh, expenditure. You're moving around more frequently. Those things will all contribute uh, to that. So yeah, limit calorie intake, I'm not going to go through that, I think so. Cholesterol. Let's see, a slightly reduced risk of high cholesterol. Uh, below average risk, which is good. My cholesterol levels usually... Well, my HDL is uh, pretty high, super high. My uh, LDL is slightly above, well, it's definitely above 100. They say that the... Um, Recommendation is to be below 100, which is pretty hard to achieve. Um, but yeah, it's not like 300, it's not 500, like some people may have, which is uh, still fine. My HDL is, uh, though, uh, super high, and the, the ratios between the HDL and the LDL are also optimal and uh, really good. What do you need to do? Exercise, maintain a healthy weight, choose healthy fats, fiber, plants, sterols, and stanols, berberine. Uh, spirulina and dietary antioxidants. Mm. Below average risk, 36 percentile. Your risk is greater than 36 percent of the population and lower than 64 percent of the population. That's good to hear. What it was that? Uh, stress. Increased ability to manage stress, low risk. That's awesome. Psychotherapy, again, relaxation techniques, purple passion flower, massage, L-theanine, valerian, exercise, avoid cigarette smoke, ashwagandha, spend time in nature. I do some of those things. I don't do the psychotherapy. I don't do the passion flower. I don't do the uh, valerian. Um, I don't take ashwagandha that often either. Uh, but... My risk is uh, greater than 5% of the population and lower than 95% of the population. So it's very low, which is awesome. <laughs> so um, my ability, my risk for stress is uh, better than 95% of people, which is good. So I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not as stressed out as 95% of people. And uh, yeah, I, I do think that I, I've never, ha never had issues with uh, like stress management and. Uh, I'm never, I've never been burned out or something. I've never uh, hit the wall <laughs> with, with like working too much or uh, yeah, also like just being able to tolerate stressful situations and being able to be in some sort of like uncomfortable situation without stressing out. I think that is, yeah, does describe uh, me uh, pretty well that uh, my ability to tolerate stress is pretty high and uh, it's higher than 95% of people apparently. <laughs> so that's kind of a true, true uh, statement and true finding from this genetics. Okay, well, I'm not going to go through the uh, what to do. I mentioned them. Blood sugar. What does it tell me about my diabetes risk? Reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. Uh, low risk, which is awesome. I've never had any blood sugar issues or insulin resistance. Uh, maintain a healthy weight. Avoid sugary foods. Resistant starch. So this is the uh, cooked and cool uh, potatoes, which I eat quite regularly. Mediterranean diet. Cinnamon, which helps with insulin sensitivity. I consume that uh, also pretty regularly. Uh, zinc, I take that sometimes. Relaxation techniques and alpha lipoic acid, which uh, ALA usually helps with, um, you know, fat oxidation and also like antioxidant defense, which uh, could be something to take. Like it's a pretty good antioxidant supplement, like much better than vitamin C, <laughs> I think uh, sometimes. Uh, okay, what's my risk? Uh, your risk is greater than 13% of the population and lower than 87% of the population. So it's, uh, yeah, in the very low end, low risk for uh, diabetes. My No one in my family has diabetes, not that I know of. Neither type 1 nor type 2. Joint pain. So what was my shoulder? Shoulder and neck pain was high, but my joint pain... My joint pain risk is uh, low, which is uh, interesting. And I've never had any joint pain issues. Uh, exercise, maintain a healthy weight, topical capsaicin, curcumin, avocado, soybean, 
unsaponifilable, unsaponifilables, something like that. We'll see what it is. A topical arnica gel, a topical black seed oil. My risk is greater than 16% of the population and lower than 84% of the population, which uh, is good. It's very low risk. And uh, yeah, I, I have had, I haven't had any joint pain. I haven't had any injuries. I did have like some, uh, like a little bit of a tennis elbow a few years ago, but it was only like for a few weeks and it recovered. Now it's like stronger than before, <laughs> stronger than ever. Um, but yeah, generally I don't have like any uh, issues with that. Let's see what was the uh, avocado soybean unsaponifibles ASU are extracts from avocados and soybean oil. These extracts support joint health. So it's apparently some sort of supplement. Taking ASU 300 to 600 milligrams a day for 1.5 months or more may slow the progression of osteoarthritis. It may also reduce the pain and improve joint function. Note that ASU may be less effective for hip osteoarthritis. So the impact and the evidence is somewhat like medium. So it's not like super strong evidence. Um, but yeah, maybe something to try if you do have uh, some pain. Topical Arnica. Arnica is a daisy-like flower that grows in the mountains. People use Arnica creams for muscle or joint pain, swelling and bruises. This is also like very medium uh, evidence for that. And black seed oil, medium evidence, medium impact. Uh, black seed oil, asthma, high blood sugar, high blood pressure, allergies and joint pain. I don't take a black seed oil, although a lot of people ask me all the time <laughs> what do I think about black seed oil. Uh, so I, I haven't done like that much research about it. Anxiety. Increased risk of anxiety. Which is a. Uh, I've never like at, at least like not right now. At uh, as an adult, I've never had any anxiety. Maybe, maybe uh, when I was in school, maybe a little bit, um, but not like super crazy. Not not that I could, not nothing that I couldn't handle or something. Like of course everyone gets anxiety in some form, every once in a while in like stressful situations, but. Um, I've never had like chronic anxiety or something like that. And right now I never get anxiety. <laughs> even when I'm like doing public speaking or uh, even if I'm doing something um, important, then yeah, I don't really get anxiety. Um, psychotherapy, reduce caffeine intake, exercise, avoid cigarette smoke, lavender, relaxation techniques, lemon balm. Uh, anxiety risk uh, 98 percentile. <laughs> My risk is greater than 98 percent of the population and lower than two percent of the population. So it's super high, and um, so it's uh, like the risk. So yeah, like if I were to not do any personal development work and not do any mindfulness work and not do any um, yeah, not do any kind of uh, stressful and anxious things, uh, then maybe my risk would be high. But because of like epigenetics is still important than genetics, my lifestyle, my habits, my personality has at least for the time being, has uh, overcome that, that I don't get any uh, anxiety, basically. And uh, the parts of your brain that process threats, tells us, is the amygdala, which is the fight or flight response, and frontal areas of the brain override the amygdala and help you respond logically. So yeah, like there's always this the reptilian brain, the crocodile brain that causes this fear response and anxiety, the kind of primitive part of the brain, and the prefrontal cortex, the neocortex, the frontal lobes, uh, those are the ones that uh, the human brain that rationalizes things away and uh, makes it helps you to overcome these things or ma suppress them or you know help to manage these uh, fear responses. So if you have like strong uh, prefrontal uh, activity, then uh, yeah, the amygdala is not going to be able to hijack your brain. You're not going to get angry. You're not going to get uh, stressed out. You're not going to get anxious. You're not going to get fearful because your uh, prefrontal cortex overrides that. Like meditation helps to probably strengthen that uh, meditation and uh, mindfulness will help to uh, develop the uh, the ability to suppress your amygdala. Next up is mood. We have three left. Mood. Mood is uh, increased risk of chronically low mood. <laughs> High risk for chronically low mood, which uh, sucks apparently. Uh, psychotherapy, exercise, light exposure, SAMe, 5-HTP and saffron. <laughs> 96 percentile. My risk is greater than 96% of the population and lower than 4% of the population. Um, so chronically low mood, I think I, w I think it would. It's not like depression. It's a it's like a different thing. Uh, maybe it's just you know this melancholy or uh, slightly, yeah, like low mood. 
basically not not being that excited. Maybe I do think that uh, it does uh, describe me a little bit. Like I'm not again like a super hyped up person. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not like some sort of joy ball in, in that sense. Uh, and if I were to be like left to my own devices, or if I didn't do anything, uh, if I were to be just in my default state, uh, then I would maybe fall or revert back into like a lower mood, so to say, like chronic lower mood uh, based upon my genetics. Uh, but again, like um, I don't live in like a box or something. I don't uh, live inside my genetics. Um, of course, there's things that you know, help to overcome that, uh, and it's not that it's um, it's not like a determined in a sense. What does it tell us about uh, the thing? Uh, it it ties it in with depression. Depression is is more than just a low mood. People with depression tend to have low motivation, problems with concentration, changes in appetite, poor sleep quality, aches and pains, thoughts of self harm or suicide. So I've never had like you know those problems. I don't have uh, low motivation. I have high motivation. I have good ability to concentrate. I don't have changes in appetite. I sleep well. No pains and aches. So um, yeah, I don't think that that's a big uh, problem for me. But I think that if I were to um, you know. If I weren't, if I weren't to do the things that I do, if I were to be like a NPC, <laughs> a non-player char character, then I would probably get into like some sort of a low, uh, low chronic low mood or depression. But you know, yeah, I'm living my own life, uh, so it doesn't gonna happen. <laughs> uh, irritable bowel. Uh, let's see, irritable bowel. Average risk of IBS. Average risk, uh, reduced stress, exercise, gluten-free diet, peppermint oil, probiotics, and psychotherapy. I never had any gut issues, no uh, leaky gut, no um, IBS, IBD, no kind of things. 55th percentile, my risk is greater than 55% of the population and lower than 45% of the population. Yeah, so something that I'm not going to touch upon uh, further. Blood pressure... Increased risk of high blood pressure, high risk, um, exercise, avoid cigarette smoke, potassium, reduce salt intake, reduce caffeine intake, reduce alcohol intake, and hibiscus. 84th percentile, my risk is greater than 84% of the population and lower than 16% of the population. Uh, but my uh, blood pressure is low. Um, it's actually lower. <laughs> it's actually low, it's like sometimes can be uh, below the reference range, so it can be too low sometimes uh, because of... I think the biggest thing, the reason for that is just uh, being low body weight uh, or low body fat, uh, exercising regularly and uh, doing intermittent fasting as well because fasting lowers blood pressure quite a lot and uh, I do that uh, very often. So uh, yeah, I think that that is one of the reasons why my blood pressure tends to be uh, lower. But in my other family, like my family members, my mother tends to have a slightly higher blood pressure. My father may also have a higher blood pressure and uh, my grandmother... Uh, from their side of the family, they all tend to have like a slightly higher blood pressure. So I do think that is uh, accurate in terms of that. It's just that me, <laughs> I've, I've done the I've done the things that the right things that lower the blood pressure, so to say. Uh, so for me, it's not um, at least for the time being. So if I were to, yeah, I have to be uh, pay attention to things like uh, tobacco use, uh, calorie intake, uh, stress, alcohol, those kind of things um, to make sure that I don't get uh, high blood pressure. Exercise is important, uh, avoid cigarette smoke, potassium, yeah, like I said, get 4,700 4, milligrams of potassium a day, potatoes are good for that. Uh, reduce salt intake, uh, I don't uh, restrict my salt, and I think that it's not relevant if you have good health, and if you have low insulin and low blood sugar, and low blood pressure as well. Like, <laughs> if you have low blood pressure, then you actually need, maybe, maybe you need more sodium and salt to raise your blood pressure. Uh, but my mine is normal most times. Reduce caffeine intake. Caffeine intake. Uh, I don't uh, restrict my caffeine, although I just usually drink only one cup, one to two max uh, cups of coffee a day. Alcohol intake. I don't drink uh, regularly. Uh, hibiscus. Yeah. So that's it. This is my report. There's also a few like I that are still generating. Eczema. Well, I've never had eczema. Never had, no one in my family also has it, uh, psoriasis, no one in my family has it, me neither, gut inflammation, I've never had it, and my own family members either, but I'll check it out maybe later. So these are the reports, you know, there's also the first legacy uh, initial one that is uh, a bit more comprehensive, 
well, not too comprehensive, but they have more reports at the moment because it's been out for like years, whereas the 2.0 beta is uh, still um, being rolled out and they generate more reports uh, down the line. But the first uh, legacy is also like uh, pretty damn also it has the same kind of reports, uh, introduction, mood, uh, anxiety, CNR1, some sort of related to sleep, uh, ADHD, PTSD, uh, COMPT. Uh, cognitive eczema, allergies, hair loss, joint inflammation, lupus, tinnitus, chronic fatigue, blood sugar, acne, food sensitivity, pain, weight loss, migraine, COVID-19, <laughs> TP53, gut health, thyroid, longevity, MTHFR, essential mineral sleep, uh, vitamins, cardiovascular, inflammation, fitness. So uh, yeah, those are really good reports uh, for that. Uh, just interesting to uh, just see, let's compare. Let's compare uh, the uh, legacy uh, weight loss report. As as you remember, my uh, my my 2.0 uh, report said that my weight loss is very good, like a very low risk. And this uh, legacy the legacy report says relatively lower than average risk of experiencing excessive weight gain, relatively lower than average risk of experiencing appetite and eating behavior related issues. Slightly better than average overall metabolism ability to burn fat. So it doesn't tell the percentages as it does in the second one. Uh, but yeah, this one also says that uh, it's a lower lower risk of obesity, which is uh, good. These reports are also like a bit more longer, um, more kind of science and uh, things like that. So yeah, these are really amazing, uh, just full 36 page report for one thing. <laughs> and they, they have... Uh, many many reports and they're constantly updating and constantly updating and then you can ch choose to get it after the fact uh, later you can also get um, the uh, lab results so i haven't uh, done uh, labs with them uh, yet but they uh, they also provide labs lab tests that will just send it to your home and uh, then you can combine it together with your uh, dna uh, reports all right, so uh, as you can see, the self decode is pretty damn awesome. You can learn a ton about your uh, genetics and what kind of risk factors you may have. I definitely learned quite a lot, like it explained <laughs> some things about uh, my health and it explained some things about my yeah, physical fitness and um, maybe like uh, psychology. Uh, so yeah, I found it pretty damn uh, useful. I think it was pretty accurate, maybe like 90% of it was accurate. Uh, surprisingly so and uh, yeah i think that's pretty damn awesome like the recommendations themselves are also like you know backed up by science and um if, if anything uh, if you don't apply the recommendations necessarily you'll still learn about maybe certain uh, risk factors like if you have a risk factor for you have bad apoe genes then uh, like a high saturated fat, fat diet may not be the best for you for example or someone something else like if you have blood blood sugar uh, genes then uh, high carb diet may not be the best for you so yeah the genetics are quite invaluable and uh, your genetics doesn't change you do the test once and uh, based upon that you can get some you know more actionable things that you need to do uh, for your health so instead of just guessing instead of shooting in the dark you actually know okay these are the things that i need to pay attention to and i think that is you know almost invaluable information in terms of like personalized healthcare personalized healthcare is the future and the personalized healthcare is a uh, very you know something that we all kind of need to take into account in a sense like we can't really follow what other people do we have to know okay well how does it apply to me how does it apply to me specifically and uh yeah what you know what things do i need to know if you want to check out uh, self code then uh, yeah you can use the code uh, seam at self or you can head over to get self the code uh, get dot self code.com forward slash seam and uh, yeah you'll be able to get uh, this at uh, 10% discount for the uh, entire uh, entire thing. All right, that's it for this video. Make sure you click the like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.